Okay, it's a real um, pleasure and uh, an honour to be here. Thank you for um, coming. So it, there's a really nice fit, I, I think, between the, the three talks that we're having. Um, it's, it's, it's nice for me because both the previous talk were speakers were called David, so both Davids were very good, but the first David, David Van Egan, um, really has talked quite helpfully um, to describe some of the brain science about uh, this, um, what, what this approach to helping to get together, if you like, a kind of treatment as usual, the ordinary treatment that uh, local services develop. Um, and it, we call it AMBIT. Uh, if you really want the long name, it's Adolescent Mentalization Based Integrative Treatment. Um, but forget that, just call it AMBIT. Um, and I'm going to talk to you really about uh, this program that's um, been developed over uh, probably about nine, ten years now. So we take some of our um, uh, uh, model is, is th there's a really lovely thing you find on the web, a guy called Etienne Wenger and Jean Lave. Um, Etienne Wenger is a geek and Jean Lave is an anthropologist. And they've come up with this really lovely idea of a community of practice. And they're saying this is stuff that's happened since the Middle Ages, really, that people who do the same kind of work like to get together and to share how they do the work and new tricks and techniques given the fact that the world's changing. So um, everything that I'm speaking about is um, really indebted to the, there's now 30 teams just about that we've trained uh, in AMBIT, um, including we've done some training with one of the um, yards at uh, Kids Company uh, in, in some of the early stages. There's another great researcher who, if anyone is interested in reading research, it's a guy called John Weiss. Um, and he, he talks about this idea of a deployment-focused way of developing new treatments, which is slightly different from a load of kind of wonks in, a, in an ivory tower deciding, actually, you don't want to do it like that, you want to do it like this, and then sort of developing a manual and then training a team and having a wonderful, shiny, randomized control tower that says this works. Uh, the deployment-focused approach is very much how we're using AMBIT. It's built on a, a first estimate of what we think might be helpful, training a team, working out how many things we got a little bit wrong or very wrong, and then training more teams, getting more feedback from them. So AMBIT is different from how it was a year ago, very different from how it was five years ago, and I'm very much sort of hopeful that it'll be uh, different again next year. It's not a, it's not a static um, approach. And also, we don't talk about AMBIT teams, really, because if you went to look at these various teams, Derry is a, an NHS team working with um, very um, psychiatrically unwell young people. They've got very little access to hospital beds um, in that part of Northern Ireland. There's a lot of sectarian violence still in the area. Um, Mac UK is a very uh, innovative uh, charity working in northwest London and now in, in Peckham too. Um, it's a voluntary sector organization using music as one of a number of tools for engaging young people. CASIS is the service that I work with in my clinical work in the NHS. It's a service for young people with quite significant substance use problems, but multiple problems, etc., etc. lots more. So we've got a kind of fairly even balance between voluntary sector organizations and um, NHS organizations. And if you went to look at each of these teams, uh, you know, I would hope that you'd see as many things that are different as, as are similar, because AMBIT is not designed to be a sort of one-size-fits-all at all. The other thing I should say is that AMBIT, uh, similar to this conference, is, is sponsored by Comic Relief uh, uh, quite largely, so um, thank you to them. So it is one of a growing family of, of approaches to therapy which we call the mentalization-based um, treatments. And um, I should just make sure that when I use that rather kind of scary word, uh, everybody has some sort of shared idea about what it is. So it's not a new idea. There's, there's Peter Fonagy, who's probably the person most uh, associated with it, says there is nothing new in mentalizing. I think he's probably being a bit, uh, you know, fake hum humility. But Socrates said, I'm the wisest man alive, for I, at least I understand that I understand almost nothing. So this was something about this kind of 
ability to think about one's own thinking, but also to understand that one has limits to one's thinking. Slightly more recently, Saraha, Buddhist sage, said, don't sit at home, don't go to the forest, but recognize mind wherever you are. Okay, so this is the boring bit, the, the definition of mentalizing. It's an imaginative activity. And that's really important that I've stressed the word imaginative. And it's a, it's, a, it's a way that we make sense of behavior. And if you remember David Van Egan's lovely slides of the kind of stress and the way that the brain works in these different systems, he was talking about the prefrontal cortex up here at the front that um, gets, gets drowned out really by this much, much more ancient thing, the amygdala and the kind of the much more ancient sort of threat arousal systems. Um, and mentalizing is really a prefrontal function. That's where, it, that's where you can find it. And we make sense of other people's behavior by imagining ourselves into their shoes. I wonder what's going on. What, I wonder how they feel at the moment. Is that why they're clenching their fists and unclenching it? I wonder what they believe about me that's making them feel maybe frightened if I've got that right. It's not about mind reading. There's a TV program called The Mentalist, which I swear at every time it comes on because it, he's like the complete opposite of a mentalizer. He just knows what's going on in your mind. Absolutely not. Mentalizing is about saying, we're not very good at this. It's hard. I have to imagine myself into someone else's shoes. And the other point about it is that you can mentalize other people, but also you can mentalize yourself. You know, every one of us will have had that experience where you kind of step back away from yourself and you say, why do I keep doing this? What's going on? You know, what drives me to keep doing this silly thing that I keep doing? Um, so we, we, we can mentalize ourselves and others. And when you look at the neuroscience, it's the same bit of brain that lights up. If you put someone into one of these clever functional MRI scans and you get them to do a mentalizing task, and you get them to do it of somebody else, maybe show them a film clip, um, or you get them to do it themselves. You know, why do you think you've happened to be in this large machine that's making clanking and whirring noises right now? Hmm. I don't know. Well, I suppose I'm kind of curious about the brain. I kind of want to see the pictures afterwards. Yeah. But if you get them to do that of, of people in a film clip or themselves, it's the same bit of brain that you see just sort of starting to glow in their, in their scan. So it's a very bedrock basic capacity of mind to do this. And we know where it is. And we know, too, that it's not genetic. It's not genetically inherited. You certainly need to inherit the machinery. And people who have the autistic spectrum disorders really struggle to do anything other than very kind of quite crude attempts to mentalize. You can you know, do some teaching with a high-end autistic spectrum child about what emotions look like but they don't have that kind of easy, natural facility to do it. Most of us do it all the time without thinking about it. The point about it is, even if you've got the machinery and you don't have the relationships in your early life particularly, and we're thinking about neglect and abuse, so many of the young people that you work with have not been exposed to the kind of relationships where you can learn and grow this capacity of your mind. Because you learn to mentalize by being mentalized and having the experience of that. How does that work? So say this, uh, this is actually a baby. And um, the baby is, is, is really, really howling. Really, really a very grumpy baby. How many times do you see a mother with a howling baby in her arms go, oh, oh you are a cross patch. Yeah. Now look what she's doing. Oh, she's frowning at the baby. She's doing what we would call mirroring the baby's experience. But she's not mirroring it, is she? Because if she was mirroring it, she'd be going, ah! That's bad parenting, yeah? She's not mirroring it. She's doing a very, very subtle thing. And this is happening every sort of minute, every 10 minutes, every hour, every day, every week, for years. She's doing what we call marked mirroring. So she's kind of caricaturing it. She's putting a sort of little frame around her imitation of what, what I think might be going on for you. you. You look like you're really unhappy. Or, oh, you look scared. Yeah? OK. So she's kind of constantly giving these kind of slightly caricatured 
versions of what I think might be going on for you now. And the baby has this experience that this is soothing. This is soothing to feel that what I'm feeling is understandable. And I can begin to see my mind in all its different states. Oh, yes, this is exciting, yeah? Okay, I see it all the time reflected in this person who I trust. The other thing for anyone working in the field with young people is there's some really interesting research now on this function of mentalizing and learning. Uh, and there's two fantastic Hungarian researchers who have magnificent names. One is called Gergely Chibra, and the other is Georgi Gergely. So go figure. But they're incredibly wonderful researchers doing this detailed sort of neurodevelopmental research. And what they're demonstrating is that something very, very particular happens at the moment, just when a child has the experience of someone going, oh, yeah, oh, oh, I can see that. If they see their mind accurately represented in the mind of another, something happens, they call it epistemic trust, and it's like a kind of door opens just for that moment where they can learn. And it's again going back to David Van Egan's lovely talk that... That is a way of accessing this prefrontal part of the brain a bit, where the hippocampus does come a bit more online, because it's extremely reassuring to have a sense that somebody's got my dilemma. Not that they just understand that maths is hard and all children are the same, but you've understood why quadratic equations really are a bit complicated. You know? um, and if I feel you've understood my dilemma, now I'm interested in learning from you, and I'll learn a lot and I'll be able to generalize that to the other parts of my life. So I'm talking about quadratic equations, but obviously that might be about handling stress. Well, um, so the question is, and I don't want to do too many questions because I think we're, but the question is, uh, are you not saying this is the correct way to think? Well, yes and no. What percentage of mothers if you really film them accurately, what percentage of good mothers, secure, well-attached mothers, what percentage of their child's communicative efforts does the mother accurately pick up on? It's very validating. Yeah, it's very validating. Yeah, so, so it's, if, that's, if that's what you mean. I mean, I think there is some didactic teaching, but I think it's working at a slightly uh, more kind of um, deep level than, than simply instructive, and particularly at the infant years. But a mother will only um, accurately reflect about 30% of her baby's um, communications accurately. And it's not that for 70% of her time she's just being a bad mother. It's because she's doing this thing called being human and living. Uh, and, and we're not very good at doing this, often. You know, we misunderstand each other, we misread each other, we just miss stuff all the time. And a certain amount of mum not getting me is sort of what motivates me to do the imagining myself. But, oh, why did she miss that? I thought I told her that I was having a really bad time. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to just move on. Sorry, the other thing about it is that we know, just as David's talk showed, that it is very easily overwhelmed. A mother who's stressed for other reasons is not going to be as able to be sensitively attuned and to mentalize her child. So what does it look like? Well, this little guy looks like he's mentalizing. But actually, um, even the highest primates, you don't really see anything approaching what we would be talking about as mentalizing, because it's primarily very language-based, actually. So he might be saying, you know, why do I keep getting in trouble over my rabbit habit? <clears throat> he might be saying, how must it feel to be you right now, boss, you know, because I just ran through my neighbor's kind of garden and I tore up their new dahlias or something. And, um... <clears throat> and he might be also um, aware of the fact that, you know, I, I, I really don't know, but, I, you know, I can wonder, I can kind of put myself into your shoes a bit and I can imagine and do this. <clears throat> and he might also be able to mentalize himself about it, that you know maybe this stems from some sort of early experiences that I had. And I'm, so kind of what I'm trying to get at is that this is the kind of flavor of this 
mental process that when you can recognize it, it's incredibly helpful in work with young people. Because one of our methods is, if you spot a young person mentalizing, show them that you've noticed. Big it up, you know. Say, I really love the way you've suddenly gone all like this. You're really kind of, you're thinking in a really different way from how you were maybe five minutes ago, because you seemed really kind of upset just then. But now it's, I just noticed, do you notice a difference in what you're doing now? So why do we make this new word up? Well, it's a bit like the mother who doesn't just present back the rage. She represents it. She represents it. Yeah? And it allows us to just kind of, if you like, do what humans do. We rebrand. We, rep we represent old material. But it allows us to give a bit of a nuance, a bit of a sort of frame. So we're, we are, in the mentalizing approaches, focused on this particular mind-brain process. It is that kind of curious, not knowing, but being really in interested to find out. It's primarily relational, it's neurodevelopmentally testable, and we can now, you know, more or less begin to anatomically define where it's happening. And when you apply it in work, it can look a bit different from some other um, modes of, of working. Having said that, um, I'll, I've got some slides later that I, I really want to emphasize that, in a sense, I think what we're proposing is that mentalizing is probably one of the common factors that all therapeutic approaches actually are rather good at helping people to do. They may put it in different words, but um, uh, when we apply it, there is definitely an attempt to kind of avoid jargon, apart from the dreadful word mentalizing. Playfulness is definitely in, very much in, um, which is connected to the third of those points, which is we're about modulating the affect. Just like David Van Egan saying, we're not into kind of doing interventions that deliberately raise the affect. We must help things to be calm and a bit of humor and uh, normally self-deprecating humor, you know, making fun of oneself a bit. The other thing is we're, we are comfortable with a bit of moderated self-exposure. So mentalizing therapies are very much about being rather sort of open source with one's thinking. I don't have all the answers in my head, but I'm not going to tell you. I'll tell you exactly what, what thoughts I'm thinking at the moment and present them as kind of... I don't know, this, what, what do you make of this? Because I'm, I'm, you know, this may sound a bit kind of crazy or not, not sensible, you know, but I'm giving the thoughts as they come rather than um, um, uh, being sort of too, too private. Uh, we're, we're quite into interrupting, not in, a, in an impolite way, apologetically. Um, but if I don't understand what's going on, I need to let that young person know or the family hesitancy, tentativeness. If I make a statement, it's always with a kind of sense that I really can't read your mind. I really can't read your mind. I really am interested, um, but I can't, do, I can't do that. We're also very m motivated by this idea that iatrogenesis means, means doctor-caused um, harm, but um, it, it applies for, for, for any of us working in the kind of health or mental health area. You know, if we do talking therapies and we think they have power, we better damn well recognize that we have the potential to do bad things with what we do as well as good things. It's tempting to think that it's only the drugs that are out there that have harmful effects. Um, I was just at a talk yesterday with a um, rather um, uh, fantastic speaker called uh, Richard Tremblay from Canada and um, he's got some really scary st statistics about the unhelpfulness of so many interventions, particularly for violent uh, young people, um, which are cause for thought. So it's an awareness and wanting to avoid that. And by and large, you know, we're very in interested in the idea that we don't want to be doing this if there is evidence that it's unhelpful. So we're interested in being evidence-based. So here's another clever picture of the brain. Um, and very briefly, um, to kind of flesh out, really, or, or just put another slant on what um, David Van Egan's talk was. There are three kind of nodes, bits of function in the brain that are, that are helpful to think about, particularly when you think about children and young people. The detection node is like a sort of radar that scans the, the social world that I'm in and is looking for any evidence that you guys are behaving in ways that you shouldn't in this setting. And you're doing that of me. So if I started to misbehave up here, to stand on a chair and wave my arms or kind of unbutton buttons on my shirt, your detection node would kind of go, that's not on the script. So this is connected 
to this hippocampus and the, the kind of memory systems. You've got a load of scripts in your brain that say this is how people should behave in a given situation. And if your detection node says this isn't right, it passes it on to the amygdala and this kind of arousal system, the stressor system, because it's, 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 it's real. There's a threat. If people are behaving in weird ways, that is dangerous, and for, for, for young people more so. And the point about this is that the third bit, the cognitive regulatory bit, is where mentalizing, if you like, mentalizing proper takes place. And one of the things you have to understand is that by the time a child reaches about the age of 10, 11, their detection node is pretty mature. It knows when things are a bit weird and a bit out of kilter and not. It's very, very clued up. I know that because every one of my three children has gone through a developmental stage where we've kind of walked into their secondary school and they've said, um, Dad, when we go into the school, can you talk quietly? Maybe walk behind me a bit. You know? So it's that sort of um, sensitivity to the fact that something could go really wrong here. Um, and they've got a very powerful affective node. Yeah, the amygdala is present in very, very kind of primitive beasties. It's been there in the, it was there in the dinosaurs, as far as we know. So these are, these are systems that are primed and ready to get the child aroused. But the cognitive regulatory node lags behind in terms of development, at least two years. So you've got this situation where they've got this incredible detection system going, but they've got no brakes to this kind of powerful engine. Um, and, and that's neurodevelopmentally kind of very solid evidence now. Um, so to put that in a, in a kind of really simple idea is that you can either have your mentalizing on and your stress and arousal off, or you've got your stress and arousal on and your mentalizing gets drowned out. So one of the ways I might talk about this with families and young people is to say that, you know, mentalizing, it only ever works at a whisper. Whereas these other old ancient systems that the dinosaurs had, they go to volume 10 very quickly, and rightly, because you know, good mentalizing includes knowing when to switch it off. You know, we had a mention of a Bengal tiger. If a tiger walked in here, I don't want to spend any time mentalizing that tiger. <laughs> I don't, you know? Okay. <clears throat> so, again, kind of picking up on the, the, the second David, David Fowler's talk, one of the key things of the young people that you are meeting is the, is the multiplicity of difficulties that they face. Often they'll present to a service that is designed to work with substance use or offending or educational failure uh, or, or, or whatever. But actually that's just the flag that they've managed to pull up their flagpole that says, oi, you know, there's a load of other things going on for me that are really, really as a kind of combination of kind of bits of rubble on my aeroplane's flight trough thing. There's just so many bits of rubble that, you know, I'm going to hit the buildings at the end of the runway. So it's, it's the kind of, it's this kind of evil synergy of these different things working together that is, is particularly toxic. <clears throat> and one of the problems, again, um, referred to already, uh, that we started to think about with Ambit was that these young people attract masses of workers often. You know, masses of workers. They'll have a youth offending officer, maybe a psychotherapist, maybe a psychiatrist, maybe a social worker, maybe a housing officer, maybe a connections worker. You know, and they, these workers are all very well intentioned. And out of the best of intentions, what we deliver to the young person is often incredibly aversive, partly because the workers have spent years training in models of understanding, um, and they kind of speak different languages. And we have this kind of odd experience where the young person and the family, who are at their most kind of fallen apart, maybe, suddenly it's as if we expect them to kind of put all these things together. That, you know, we've been arguing about whether to use cognitive behavioral therapy or social uh, approaches or, you know, parenting courses or the law. Uh, for 120 years, probably more, yeah, probably 1,000 years. Um, and suddenly it's like we, 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 we put a lot of responsibility on these people to, to make sense of it. One of the things that I've found very helpful about this idea of mentalizing and mentalization is because it is an idea that it, it's explicitly drawing on a whole load of different areas of thinking people from a cognitive behavioral background will recognize that that's what they do all the time. They try to mentalize with their young people. Systemic therapists, this is a highly systemic 
approach. Because if my mentalizing breaks down and I start believing I absolutely know that my son's doing this because he's a bad boy, you can be sure that his mentalizing is going to break down in about two seconds. You know, it's, it's one person's mentalizing collapses, the other one does. And the other way around, if I can mentalize my son as he's in a bit of a grump, he's more likely to have an experience of kind of, oh yeah, dad's got it, yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, no, well, I suppose I'll be there, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> there's just this hope that, you know, this is kind of the beginnings of a coming together of some of these academic and practical disciplines that it offers the hope of a bit of a common language. So the kind of, the traditional model, the team around a child, is brilliant. If the child and the family are in a place that they can accommodate that and they can manage it. And, you know, a good TAC meeting actually, you know, often works out the right sequence for people to, to meet and work out. But it can be quite aversive. We're proposing a, 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 a second model, not as an alternative, but as a, a something that, that should be, you know, part of the deal, which is that, you, you know, particularly you guys, you know, it may be that you have a relationship with a young person that actually has that, that phrase I had, epistemic trust, that they experience you as getting them. Right? It may be that they could manage that with one person, but asking them to do it with four people is just too much for them. And we know that change in these young people's lives occurs primarily in a relational context. It's relationships that are going to help this stuff to happen. Very much what David Van Egan was talking about in Kids' Company. It's about relationships. So if you want to sort of strengthen the relationship between a worker and the young person, what you better start thinking about too is the relationship of all these other workers to the worker. Because, amazingly enough, mentalizing may be very fragile in the young people that you're working with and their families, but it's pretty fragile in you too as a worker. And that's the, my, for me, the, the, the biggest thing for me that's helpful is this notion that mentalizing is a great leveler. My mentalizing is rubbish when everyone's shouting at me and telling me I'm rubbish. You know, it's really hard to do this stuff. So that we have to think about how do we support the, the mentalizing in the worker just as much as trying to promote mentalizing in the young person and the family. <clears throat> so the sort of MBT approach, I think some of the things that you hear from families or young people, you know, they like this fact that it's, it's, it's not about kind of upping the ante, it's about kind of keeping a playfulness. They like the, not, the lack of kind of too much jargon. They like the fact that we're very non-expert in the way that we approach this. They like it when we validate their experience, blah, blah, blah. They particularly like the humor and playfulness. I mean, basically anything goes. If, you, if you've got a problem that you want to help a young person or family mentalize about, I will use any endless games or kind of techniques to try to kind of find ways of doing of, 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 of triggering that. So AMBIT tries to um, use mentalizing really in three directions. We want to help the young person and the family to mentalize, but we equally want to help support and sustain the mentalizing in the worker. And we also want to use mentalizing in the uh, wider multi-agency network that these young people work in. And this looks quite complicated, but it's, it's designed to be sort of almost memorable in the field. Around the outside, we have what we call the stance. So these are like the grab rails of um, if you're in a kind of tube and it all starts to rock and you can kind of hang on. And we've kind of worked these through over the last sort of 10 years really around sort of the experiences of the teams we're working with to find ones that had sort of real kind of value and um, seem to help people to find a bit of balance in a world that's very chaotic and anxiety provoking. Uh, the work that you do makes you anxious and if it doesn't make you anxious, you're in the wrong job, you know, you're in the wrong job. Um, so the, the stance, we're really into scaffolding existing relationships rather than being a complete replacement because, you know, amazingly enough, I'm not going to be around 10 years from now for this young person, but family members or other sort of more enduring social structures are. So we're looking to look for resilience factors, maybe an aunt or an uncle that they had a relationship with that we could re repair back, maybe a football team. Sometimes the most curative things we've done with young people is to help them get back into their football team. It's rather apt that I'm saying that here, isn't it? <clears throat> On the other hand, if you're trying to scaffold existing relationships with some of the young people who you work with, you're, you're scaffolding quite dodgy relationships. 
scary places, you know, places that are high risk. Uh, and so the kind of counter to that is this idea of clinical governance, that ambit approaches are not fluffy about risk and about doing things in a, in a kind of proper, carefully assessed way. Uh, so that's what we call by um, clinical governance. Then um, we're interested in, because of the complexity, we're not interested in just working with this young person's thoughts and feelings. We're interested in their social activity. We're interested in their, acti their, their um, education. We're interested in their family, if there is one, or care setting. So it's a constant attempt, actually, to, to widen the lens of where we might be a uh, applying work, rather than saying, oh, I'm going to do some great CBT, but nothing else is going to happen, so it'll all collapse because the system will just pull this young person back down. But because that often involves in interacting with other agencies, the counter to that is that the key worker has an explicit role to try to help integrate all the different things that are happening. They might work as an interpreter for different parts of the, of the network. <clears throat> On the other side, we're very big in this idea of uh, supervisory structures. And just as we want to foster a, a strong individual key worker relationship <clears throat> in which epistemic trust and, and learning and change can start to happen, we, we also want an equally powerful relationship between the key worker and team members. And that's not something that we would want to sort of downplay at all. I'd want to up that. You know, it seems to me that as strong a relationship as I have with a young person, as strong I have to have with team, team members. So that there's this constant kind of um, balancing of the risk of being drawn into quite pathological patterns of interacting with these young people. Let's be frank, you know, some of them are seductive. They ask you to collude with very scary and risky things. It's very easy to kind of go native, if you like, and to kind of down-regulate your own risk awareness because, well, all the kids I work with, you know, they're all using crack, they're all shooting up this, they're all doing that, so maybe it's not that bad, you know. And it's very easy to do that, and I need other people who are not in the heat, and their mentalizing is a little bit more uh, capable to uh, uh, help me hold, hold that. So these, these kind of stance elements kind of tug backwards and forwards, and it's a sort of fairly dynamic approach. At the bottom, the final two, I'll stop that, otherwise you'll feel very dizzy. Um, <clears throat> at the bottom, one of the things that teams that we've trained have often had an experience of is in, in the past with trainings, and I think in our early trainings too, was that a training for a team, we only train teams in AMBA, we don't train individuals, um, it can feel like a kind of a, a sort of spaceship landing on your head from somewhere far away, saying everything that you've done before, just forget it, just do this. And that would be very disrespectful of the kind of, you know, already referred to amazing amount of expertise here about what it's like working in this particular area with these young people and an amazing amount of individual training and skills that have got on. So Ambit would want to take a very respectful stance to that, but also would expect a team to take a respectful stance to other members of the network. Because the problem that you get is we get biased feedback about other agencies. Why? Because a young person only comes to my service if, by definition, they've been in touch with three other services and they still need me. Those services have failed, have they? You know? And young people make me want to help them more by doing a very subtle technique that builders do all the time, too. They tell you how rubbish the other person is. You know, that social worker I was working with, she was crap. You know, and immediately a little fire lights up in me saying, hey, Trump the social worker. <laughs> very, very easy to get into that and to get drawn into that. And services get mythologies, mythological beliefs about what other services are about and how they work and why they're useless or why they're not, they're not really caring. And these are toxic to the work for the young people. And we're recreating the families that have abused these kids if we fight amongst us, each other. We're recreating the same brutal um, experience they've had of the two people that they had hope in knocking seven bells out of each other. It's incredibly destructive. On the other hand, respect for local practice and expertise is one thing, but there's this embarrassing thing called evidence. So where there is evidence, we ought to have the respect for our clients to use evidence-based approaches. And that's a tension, you know. Sometimes evidence and, and what I really know is going to work here is not quite the same thing. 
And we approach that by using an, a, a different approach to a treatment manual, which is that you guys write your manual on top of and over the one that we've offered as a sort of, as a beginning. Um, so I, if I've got time, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about it. Oh, I will tell you about it now. Yeah. So we use this kind of funky software. Um, we were very thrilled. We won a big innovation award, a national Innovation Nation Award from uh, the Guardian newspaper and Virgin uh, for this technology. Uh, so before you all close off, and this is only a very brief bit, but what this allows us to do is we have curated, if you like, a kind of a best guess about what we think is sort of some of these helpful principles that I've been talking about. But a local team that we train can open their own manual. In fact, anybody can open their own manual. It's, it's there for free. It's all open source. Um, you, can, you can open your own manual and automatically all the content from our manual can be included in yours. So you get what we've offered up. And um, what we've got now is yeah, about 30 versions of the manual, all, all sharing. But what, you get, what teams can then do is, and we encourage them to do, is to start to write your own manual. Because the team that manualizes itself, why do we do it like this? When would we do it like that? It's a bit like the team mentalizing itself, making sense of why we behave it, but also developing a culture in your team about how we work together. It's about this notion of a well-connected team. So say a great bit of little excellent local practice arrives. Maybe a, a worker just has this beautiful way of introducing the embarrassing subject of contraception to a young person at risk of uh, uh, unwanted pregnancy. And she's just got a lovely way of introducing it that's playful and just is seen to work. They might want to just video her role-playing that with one of their colleagues and bung the video clip into a, their manual just as a kind of, you know, just a little adding thing. This is how we would sort of recommend is one way to, to go about introducing contraception. And it might be that another team would, because the software allows teams to kind of look across at what other people are coming up with and what they're doing, would say, yeah, that's great. We'll just use that in ours. And if we see bits of good practice kind of propagating to other teams, we could bring it down to the, the core and then automatically everybody gets it. So it's a way of best practice and developing best practice in a world that's changing all the time. I mean, in the drugs world, there's new substances coming out every kind of 10 days, probably more. Um, and, you know, nothing stays still. And the idea that there's kind of a book that says this is how to do it, it's going to be the same 10 years from now as it is now, it's too, to me seems utterly rubbish. And it's also utterly non-learning. It's non-mentalizing. It's this assumption that we know. Well, we don't know. You know a lot of what we do is, 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 is on the journey to being helpful. So the manual looks a bit like that. Um, you, can, you can find it uh, online. That's the sort of core that you get as a, as a beginning. But um, other teams have started to sort of... Uh, um, uh, uh, develop their own versions. There's some really lovely stuff coming from Edinburgh. Mac UK have done some really lovely material there. Um, so please have a, have a, have a, have a look. Oh, sorry, this is the important bit. That. That's the website. So that's a kind of um, like a signposting website that will tell you a bit if you're geeky enough to be interested in what these things are. But more importantly, it has links to Ambit. Um, uh, there's another manual on there, mentalization-based treatment for families. Uh, and I guess the other point that I would make is, you know, I've gone from being not at all geeky to probably quite geeky now, that, that I'm really into this idea of open source programming. It's a different way that software programmers use to develop programs from the old Microsoft image, which was that, you know, we'll write the program, then we'll wrap it in 29 million layers of sort of encryption and secrecy, and then every year we'll sell you another version. Open source says, no, no, we don't do it like that. We write a bit of code, and we just immediately put it on the, on the web. And if people are interested, they'll have a look at it. And they'll give us feedback. They'll say, that's rubbish. This is better. And then you've got a better bit of code. And then another person says, but actually, I can add this and do this with it. Oh, well, that's good. And it seems to me that this is a very powerful way of us as a community of practitioners to kind of stop infighting and start kind of doing the job, which is about working out what works for young people who are, you know, neglected and abused and really need, you know, better than we're offering at the moment. So thank you very much.